Hello students, welcome to another session of political science class with me and in this session also we will continue with your unit 10, okay, making of the constitution. Now, so far we have discussed about the constituent assembly, yeah, the deliberations, the discussions, the debates that has been taken in the constituent assembly and now we have also finally covered up the enforcement or the enactment of the constitution and finally it came into force on the 26th of January 1950. Okay, we have to talk about the sources of the Indian constitution. Now the remaining topic is to, okay, objective resolution and the silent features of the constitution. All right, the objective resolution. Okay, in 1946, all right, in 1946, a resolution was passed by Jawaharlal Nehru in the Constituent Assembly, all right. A resolution passed by Nehru in the Constituent Assembly and this resolution came to be known as the Objective Resolution. Okay, what is this Objective Resolution all about? The opening words of the resolution, okay, the starting words, it says that it will constitute, the Constituent Assembly declares India to solemnly resolve and to proclaim India as an independent sovereign republic and to draw, all right, and to draw up for her future governance a constitution. So this is the opening lines of the objective resolution. I quote here again, the constituent assembly declares its firm and solemn resolve to constitute India, okay, as an independent sovereign republic and to draw up for her future governance a constitution. So this is the opening words of the objective resolution. They have several features or points in the objective resolutions. Now we'll discuss them. Its main points, okay, are point number one. It says that India is an independent sovereign republic. Independent, we know that she got independent from the British rule, yeah, sovereign. She has the supreme authority, yeah, the republic. The supreme power is held by the people through elected representative. So point number one, it declares India as an independent sovereign republic. All right. Now point number two, it says that India should be a union of territories. That is what we find in article one also. Yeah, India is a union of territories. And it also says that all those territories who are willing to be a part of India will be or will come under the union of territories. Now, point number two is about this whole of territories and the other, those parts who want to be a part or who wants to come under the domain of the Indian Union, okay? Now, point number three, it says that the sovereign India, it shall derive all the powers from the people, okay? Point number three, it's important. Now, point number four, it says the justice, when you say justice in this area okay social economic and political okay justice in these three sphere as well as equality of status and of opportunity freedom of speech all right freedom of thought expression belief faith and worship these all freedoms should be entitled to all the people okay without any discriminations all right that is your freedom of thought, your expression, belief, faith and worship should be given to all the citizens of India. Now point number five, it says that adequate safeguards should be given to the protection and promotion of minorities. Now minorities as well as the depressed sections of the society. All right. Now it also talks about protection and promotion of the backward or the most tribal areas also okay it not only talks about the protection for them it also talks about protections of their land okay those tribal areas so that is under your point number five now point number six it talks about integrity integrity of territories now it says that the sovereign india should have sovereign power over the territory as well as the land yeah territory land air and water all right, these all should come under the supremacy of the Indian Union. And it also says that this should be maintained according to the justice of a civilized state. Now, point number seven, it says that this ancient land, 
Okay, now this ancient clan is referring to India. All right, it says that India should make full contribution towards maintenance of world peace and allow welfare of the mankind. Now, when we look at these objective resolutions from point number one to point number six, it shows or it talks about India's, all right, what India want to do, what India wants to give to her people, okay, what India want to defend, example, your territory, yeah. Now, in the last point number seven, it talks about how India should also make contribution in maintaining the world peace as well as for the welfare of the mankind. So these are the seven important points that was made in the resolution that was put forward by Nehru. Now, the famous objective resolution, okay? Now this was examined by the drafting committee. They made some verbal changes. They made amendments to these points. And finally, these points that we have just discussed, we find it in the present preamble of the Indian constitution. So the preamble of the Indian constitution, it has retained the spirit, all right? And as far as the language of the objective resolution is concerned. So in conclusion, we can say that the objective resolution, whatever points that was put forwarded by Nehru in this resolution, it's finally turned into the preamble of our present constitution. Now we should remember that Preamble is part of the constitution, okay? It is not that preamble is different and constitution is different. Preamble, it is the introductory of the Indian constitution, all right? So this is all about the objective resolution. Now, the next topic is the silent features of the constitution. What are the features? Now, the present constitution, it came into force on the 26th of January 1950 yeah now we are in 2020 now our constitution is around 70 years old yeah we'll talk about the features the first feature it says that it is a written constitution yes it is a written constitution it is the work of the framers of the constituent assembly who have represented our voice and opinions in the constituent assembly so it is a written it was written by the framers of the Indian constitution all right now, point number two, it says that Indian constitution, it is the lengthiest constitution that was ever framed by a free country. Okay, now Indian constitution, it has around 395 articles, okay, divided into 22 parts and 12 shido. All right. 295 articles divided into 22 parts and 12 schedules. The, with the presence of this, it makes Indian constitution as one of the lengthiest constitution to be ever framed by a free country. All right. Now, point number three, it says democratic and republican features. Now, our constitution, it has a, both these features, okay? It has a democratic features as well as the republican features. Now, when we say democratic freedom, or democratic features it's talking about the people's right to choose a candidate yeah elections has been held now here universal other suffrage plays an important role in a democratic government now it says that what is the principle that we find in a democratic the right to vote now every citizens of India they have been given this right that is the universal other suffrage and those who have attained the age of 18 can vote in the election. Now in India, we have or we conduct election after every five years, yeah? And in, it is in this election that the people are given the right and the authority to elect their ruler. So this is one of the democratic features. Now what about the Republican features? The Republican features is that the head, okay? The head of the state, it is the president. Now he is just the nominal hand and his or her function is of a ceremonial or a formal in nature. All right. So this shows that it is a mixture of both democratic and republican features. Okay. Now point number four, it says parliamentary or cabinet system of government. When I say parliamentary or cabinet system of government, there is two important points here. Okay. Firstly, the head of the state, okay, the head of the state, his or her function is ceremonial in nature, okay, or we can say it is 
formal in nature. When I say ceremonial or formal in nature, it is referring to the president. All right. So he is the head of the state and he is just the nominal head. Okay. Now point number two, the real executive. Okay. The real executive, it is in the hands of the consuls of consuls of ministers headed by the prime minister. So they are the real executive. All right. Now, the president, the president has to act on the advice of this. Okay. Consuls of minister headed by the prime minister. Now, the consuls of minister and the prime minister, they are responsible for the legislature of the act. In other words, we can say that they are responsible to the Lok Sabha, that is, in the other name is the house of the people. So they are responsible for this, okay? So the, the councils of minister, headed by the prime minister, they are the real executive, all right? And the president, on the other hand, is the nominal executive and his functions is formal in nature, all right? Okay, so this is on the point number four, that is parliamentary or a cabinet system of government. Point number five, we have a centralized federation. Now, centralized, it's referring to the power in one authority, right? A unitary state is one in which all the powers are vested in the center, or you can say it is vested in a single hand, okay? That is also called centralized. Now, what about federation? On the other hand, federation or a federal form of government is where power is distributed between the center and the state. Now our constitution, it has a blend or it is a mixture of both these two, that is central and federal features. Okay. Now what are the points that shows a federal features? Point number one, there is a coexistence, a relations between the center and the states. Yeah, all the states, all the 29 states of India has a cordial relations with the central government. This is the one feature. Now the second feature is that there is a division of power between the central government and the 29 states. Yeah. And point number three, the last is the Supreme Court, the role of the Supreme Court. The role of the Supreme Court, his or her voice, okay, it is final. All right. Now it is final and it is the, he is the, or it is the interpreter of the constitution. So these three features shows a federal features. Now what are the centralized features? Now, point number one, it is in the hands of the parliament, okay? The power is in the hands of the parliament to create any laws or to increase the number of state or to reduce the number of state or to make any changes relating to the boundary. So, anything that is to do with state, formation of new state or altering of boundaries, it is in the hands of the parliament, okay? Now, point number two. We have governors, yeah? We have governors in every state. The appointment of the governor is also in the hands of the central government. Now, that is, the governor is appointed by the president on the advice of the councils of minister headed by the prime minister, okay? So, this is the other centralized feature. They are, point number three will be emergency provisions, okay? In, in the constitution of India, we have three different emergency provisions, yeah? The first is the national emergency, Second, we have state emergency. Third is the financial emergency. Now to declare these three emergency, it is also in the hands of the central government. The state has nothing to say in this declaration or in the proclamation of emergency. Now point number four, the last point. The central government, okay, it has the sole authority over all India services. All India services conducted by the Union Public Service Commission, UPSC, right? So in this also, the central government, it has the final say or we can say the central government has total control over this examination that is all India service. So these are the four features which points out or which talks about a centralized form of government. So we can say that in this feature. Okay, in conclusion, we can say that the constitution is to be a federal in form and unitary in spirit. All right, it has both these features. Now, point number six, it talks about single citizenship. Okay, now in the constitution of India, it gives single citizenship. That is the right to citizenship to all the people of the 
India. Okay, no matter what states you are living in, you have the same right under the Constitution of India as because it provides only a single citizenship. Now, point number seven, it talks about reservation of seats. The constitution, it provides reservations of seats even in education as well as employment. Yeah. Now, when we talk about reservation of seats in politics, it gives reservation of seats in the Lok Sabha. Okay. Now, reservations of seats, they are done by the delimitation commission. Okay. The reservation of seats are handled by this. Okay. Now the delimitation act of 2000 of 2008. It made changes to the reservation of seats in the Lok Sabha. Okay. What did they change? They provided that 84 seats for scheduled caste and 47 seats for scheduled tribe. Okay, so this is what they made changes to the reservation of seats in the Lok Sabha. Now, delimitation act or the role of the delimitation is to make reservation of seats not only to the Lok Sabha but also it provides reservation of seats to the respective state assemblies. Okay, so this delimitation dealing with the number of seats, okay, constituencies. Now, point number eight fundamental rights and fundamental duties. Now, the Constitution of India, it provides fundamental rights, yeah. Now, fundamental rights is divided into six categories, yes or no. And these fundamental rights are justifiable, okay, and they are also enforceable in any court of law. If you think your rights has been violated, you can approach any courts and fight for your rights. This is what is meant by justicable, okay. Now, the 42nd Amendment Act, okay. The the 42nd the 42nd amendment act of 1976 okay the 42nd amendment act of 1946 it added a new part that is part 4a okay part 4a now what is this part 4a the part 4a it talks about your fundamental duties on one hand you have the fundamental right on the other hand you also have your fundamental duties now the most important fundamental duties the text has mentioned is to uphold and protect the in sovereignty and integrity of the indian union okay and the other one is to protect public property okay point number nine we have directive principle of state policy now directive principle of state policy it proclaims india as a social welfare state now social welfare state is state which provides services like education health care yeah employment and also assistance in medical assistance in terms of your all age so these are the features which proclaims a welfare state now point the other point is secularism india is a secularist yeah we have freedom of religion we can practice profess and propagate any religion that we want to. This is secularism. And the last, combination of rigidity and flexibility. The Indian constitution is both rigid and flexible. Okay, there are some features which cannot be amended easily. That is what is called rigid and some there are some features which can be amended easily. That is called flexible. Okay, now it has, when it comes to amendment of the constitution, we have three. That is Article 4, 169 and 239A. These three articles can be amended easily. They are through the simple majority. The second is we have some features which need two-third majority. Okay, two-third majority. Now two-third majority, it is a blend of both rigid and flexible. All right. Now the third category is we need two-third majority from both houses of the parliament, that is Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, as well as the voice of the state legislature. This is your third category, okay? The first is simple majority, the second is only two-third majority, okay? The third is two-third majority with state legislature. For example, the GST that we have, okay? In order to implement GST, it needed both two-third majority as well as the voices of the state legislature. So these are the 12 silent features 
of the Indian constitution. Okay, so with this we end your unit 10 also we end your session. Okay, thank you.